remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. Race that have been following the past two lectures, and this is the third lecture. Uh, the fourth one will be Wednesday, and this is the first installment of this whole um, uh, exercise of um, flushing out the whole um, concept and idea of Pan Africanism from the personal to the collective. And so, uh, again, uh, Professor Leo, Uncle Leo, uh, will be taking over and at the end we'll make some announcements and question and answers. And the last one is Wednesday. After that, we'll announce the second installment of lectures he will do himself. We want to follow it through. And then after that, we're going to organize in the same discipline for a small cadre of people, uh, lectures from the you know, not only now the Pan-African concept, but the culture of liberation. When most African intellectuals are now talking about the mental liberation of Africans. We've been talking a whole lot about the economic, the armed struggle culminated, South Africa ended all that. And now, uh, is this more armed struggle or is it a culture of liberation? I think to flush all that corner out, we will organize and let you know. And I know Ackland is the, one of the people who will give you the first installment of the class on cultural liberation. And then from there we'll talk, because every teacher here goes into advisory committees to run the academ this ac academy, a study group, whatever you call it. We're going to have the same teachers turn into the, you know, the curriculum designers of this uh, loosely structured academy that we're trying to pursue. Thank you again for coming. Uh, Azra, thank you again for reminding us. To be here on time, <laughs> she sends me to go and get something. She gets on my case where I'm I and uh, I'll just get out of my best. Thank you again. And Ambassa, this is a sang hero. He's been doing all the camera work. No, not many young people want to stick with this thing where we get few. And Paul Coates' son yesterday showed us there are our documenters. The documenters of the collective memory of black kids of the Reagan era. It's a powerful story he wrote. And I hope you buy it. The book is all sold. But the kid is an amazing writer. We want to hear more from him. First of all, let me just apologize for being late. But I made a series of commitments some time ago with no idea what the weather would be like today. And I've been up and out since 7 o'clock this morning in this weather. And so at this point when I came in, if I'd come in the room, I would have been non-functional to go and wash my face in cold water. I hope I'm functional. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I am functional. So, <clears throat> let me just try to get into this by recapping in, a, in five minutes. Where we have been and where we are. No, I have one. You do? Yeah. But you can also do yeah. it like this, what I do at my yeah, age. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I did not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because what we are trying to do here, let me tell you what we are trying to do here. All of you have been involved. So I'm really talking to the choir. But one of the things that probably we have, even members of the choir, we don't understand the principles underlying the activities that we encounter every day. And one of the tricks of the game is to get you to do busy work. Mm -hmm. By busy work, we mean, 
نمیگیره نه که همه ما همین مرد بیزو باشد تا اما ما اون پرنس و نه او ایست بی ات هاورد یونیورسی روی گیونت و نای استابشت اربن ستادیس پروگرام And we we established the urban studies program because Richard Hatcher had been elected mayor of Gary, Indiana. And when Richard Hatcher was elected mayor of Gary, Indiana, the white said that is is not acceptable. We cannot have a black man as mayor of Gary, Indiana. They locked, they padlocked the doors to the mayor's office. And Richard Hatcher could not get into the mayor's office. We had to go to court to sue to get Richard Hatcher into the mayor's office. And when the court ruled in our favor, Police were obliged to go and break the locks off the door. And when we went into the office, every, you know, Gary, Indiana is over a river, sits on top of a river. And everything, the files, the cabinet, everything had been thrown in the river. Is, I'm not discussing theory. I told you before, I'm not here to discuss theory. This is a course in practical activity. Everything had been thrown in the river. In those days, we didn't have computers. We had typewriters. All the typewriters, all the filing cabinets, all the files, all the documents, everything had been thrown in the river. So Richard Hatchell, was obliged to take over as mayor of Gary, Indiana, with no sense of history, no institutional memory. Everything had been thrown in the river. We then looked around the United States and discovered that in the entire United States at that time, there was only one black city manager. In those days, all city managers were trained at Michigan University. There's no other university training city managers. What time period? What year? 1968. 1968. Would you all understand? Yeah. Yeah. 68. And I want you to understand also so that the same thing happened with the French and Guinea when Sekouture in 1968. Decided to move with Nkrumah, and Ghana became independent, and Guinea became independent. The French threw away everything and mashed up everything in Guinea. Everything, every, 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 everything, so that Secretary had to start running a country from scratch with nothing available, all the memory and everything. This is '68 in in America. That is 40 years ago. That's how no. it is. We therefore decided. Never again should this happen to a black man. We first did a study, and we discovered that there were 30 cities in the United States that were capable of electing black mayors for these reasons. There was a sufficiently large black population. There was a sufficiently large liberal white population. There was a sufficiently large pop liberal population that didn't call themselves black or white. That is to say Latinos and others, but they were liberal. And that that combination was a majority. And that therefore we identified 30 cities in which the potential existed to elect a black mayor. So we went to the International Association of City Managers 
And we said to them, we want you to give us six scholarships per year for five years to train city managers. And we said that we can train people in two years. People who are graduate, undergraduate, but with, you know, above average. We can train them in two years so that at the end of two years, they can run a city effectively. They say, impossible, you can't do it. They say, that's impossible, you, you can't do it. Roy Jones was an American. And he was slightly more hesitant, but I was stupid because I didn't come. I wasn't born here, and I don't understand these restrictions. And I told him, now, let me tell you something. I wasn't born here, but I know about the Tuskegee Airmen. And I know that you told Dax that they were intellectually incapable of flying an airplane. And you told them they couldn't evolve. But when they insisted, and you admitted the first 10 blacks into the program, they graduated one through ten. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. The first ten blacks that were admitted into the Tuskegee program were graduate who were told that they had the they did not have the intellectual and genetic capacity to learn to fly a plane. When we got the first 10 in, they graduated one through 10. And so we tell them, listen, this time, times have changed. And if you don't give us these 10 scholarships, we will tell the world America has made no advance, and you have not moved beyond the concept of the Tuskegee, you know, and they got frightened. But they didn't still know what to do. So we said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We will sign a document saying, if we fail, we will publicly <coughs> go on TV and we will admit that we have failed and you can make jokes of us. Because we knew we weren't going to fail. And when we told them that, they didn't know what to do. So they gave us the 10 scholarships six scholarships per year for five years to train 30 city managers. That's how we got it. We trained six scholarships per year for five. We trained the first six and they graduated. Most of you will remember the city manager what was Elijah Rogers, Elijah Rogers was in our class. Bob Moore, the mm -hmm. director of housing, was in our class. All six graduated and have gone on to great things. The second year, one dropped out, five graduated, and they have gone on. When this occurred, they got frightened. And they came to us quietly and said, but you're taking jobs away from white people. We said, but that is the intention. Uh -huh. No, this is what they actually told us. You're taking jobs away from white people. This, this is, we said, we said, so what? That is our intention. So they came on campus and they told the students in the third year, that we were limiting their employment opportunity by <coughs> training them as city managers. That if, or, if they were trained as general administrators, there would be more possibilities of employment than to be trained as city managers. We said to them, that is like telling a student, don't do medicine do biology or chemistry because the job opportunities are wider. There are many more companies that employ biologists and chemists than doctors. 
right? When we didn't do that, they went to cheek. We had all already agreed that we needed a school of business and public administration. Mm -hmm. We all agreed on that. We knew we needed it, but we didn't have the money. They went to Cheek and they offered Cheek $5 million mm -hmm. to establish a school of business and public administration on condition that he destroy the city management mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm saying this, on the, I know I'm being clear, but I'm saying this because it's true. She accepted, and they launched psychological warfare <laughs> against the Urban Studies program. program. And the, how we got around it, we used to go to the office every morning at 7 o'clock in the morning and work until 10 o'clock at night. And Andrew Billingsley, <laughs> who was vice president for academic affairs, listed as one of the leading sociologists in America, was appointed by Cheek as the hatchet man to destroy us. Mm -hmm. And what they did was, he didn't know we were coming in at 7 o'clock in the morning. So he would wait until 9 o'clock thinking, hoping that we were late. Because had we been late, we could have been fired for not being on time. And he would call at 2 minutes after 9. We need a report by 10 o'clock. Something he had never told us before. At 9.30, we need a report at 11 o'clock, a different report. But Roy and I anticipated all of these things. And so when he called and said, I need a report at 10 o'clock, we said, no problem, because we had the report already written. We had anticipated it. When he said, I need a report at 11, we had anticipated that we had the report. So we gave them the report. That didn't work. But the next thing that happened, he sent out, Roy Jones got panicked. Panicked. He couldn't deal with this amount of stress. Mm -hmm. Couldn't deal with this amount. So we had to send him on vacation. And I took over. He called me and he said, Leo, do you have the file on this? I said, yes, I have the file. He said, will you send the file over to my office? I said, What I did tell him. I'm not a stranger to these things. I had been involved in the struggle for independence in Jamaica. I had learned my politics at age 15 fighting against the British. And I knew the first thing you had to do was to keep a second set of fathers. <laughs> so he says, send me the fire. No, no problem. So I sent the fire. A week passed and I got a call. Leo, where are the files I requested? You see, what he didn't know, he thought I was going to send the file by a messenger. I took the files myself to his personal secretary. I got his personal secretary to sign for the files. <coughs> so I had all of that. I said to him, I pretend you, you have the files. He said, no, I don't. I said, well, that is very strange. Well, I have a receipt signed by your personal secretary for the file. So you better go talk to your personal secretary. Not finish with that. So he waited for two days and he called. He says, Leo, yes, my personal secretary admits this, but we can't find it. Do you have a, another copy? I said, no, I don't. I said, that's the only official. I didn't say that's the only copy. I said, that's the only official copy that I have. He didn't hear the word official. <laughs> so he thought I said, that's the only copy. So convinced that I didn't have a second set of copy, a second copy, he called a meeting of deans and heads of, of departments. 
and Andrew willingly sat in that and lied Ooh. to the whole group, to the deans mm -hmm. and heads of departments of Howard University mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. this program. In the meantime, what I am doing, they brought a group down from Harvard to evaluate the program. And the group from Harvard, we had thought they were going to say that the academic piece was weak. But the group from Harvard wrote an official report saying, this is the best pro academic program that exists in the country. The problem is not that it is with the practicum, because what we did in the first year, we gave them just theory. And then we gave them a practicum. You had to spend three months, the community group, three months with a local government, and three months with the federal government. So when you graduated, you knew the thing from three angles. That is what they were worried about, because Bob Moore, who was interested in housing, had done his practicum with the Department of Housing. And when Bob Moore graduated, he was made a special assistant to the Secretary of Housing. Mm -hmm. And on his first day at work, the Secretary of Housing called and said, Mr. Moore, I want to give you a lecture, an orientation on how the Department of Housing operates and what we want of you. And Bob Moore was, <coughs> was not very political at the time and said to him, I don't need a lecture from you. I did my thesis on the Department of Housing. I know how it operates, and I am here to change it. Oh, oh my God. Oh, God, that was right. <laughs> oh, how can somebody just graduating tell the Secretary of Housing, I know, and I'm here to change it? So what they were frightened about was the practical. So Harvard University wrote a report saying, this is academically the best program. But what we suggest, that the, that the academics should remain with Harvard, but the practicum should be transferred to Harvard. Mm. you understand that? No. So let's come back to this meeting. That's it, this meeting. After Billingsley had lied, he decided to close the meeting. Now, I haven't said a word. I'm sitting here. And I said, no. Nothing. He decided, and I said, no, 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 you can't close the meeting. He said, what are you saying? I said, no, no, no. The laws say you are innocent until proven guilty. You have made charges against my department. You cannot, therefore, close the meeting without giving me an opportunity to respond. And I thought, everybody agreed. And I leaned over and pulled out the second fire, which he didn't know that I had. Right? And I passed the fire around. I said, gentlemen, would you please each read these files, which is precise duplication of the fire that Dr. Billingsley has. And you will see from this that the contents of this file contradict what Dr. Billingsley, Vice President for Academic Affairs, told you. In other words, he has deliberately and consciously lied to you. And that's what are the words I use. And brilliantly <laughs> called the meeting. Close. Close. Is it down? Right? But the file was going around because people didn't move. Mm -hmm. And they all read the file. Then he called me in the office and he said, Leo, I don't understand you Caribbean people at all. <laughs> <laughs> So what are you talking about? He says, I could never go into a meeting with James T and call him a liar. You called me a liar. I said, yes, I did. He said, but I said, Billingsley, you may be a boy, but I'm a man. And if you are a boy, then I don't deal. I said, because you're a psychopath. And I will predict what will happen to you. I said, Chief has told all his people, 
do not let any problems get through to me, because if they get through to me, you will be fired on the spot. I said, what is going to happen is there are problems when it gets through to Chief, and he's going to fire you on the spot. Well, three days, four or five days later, it happened. A problem got through to Chief, which he couldn't handle. He called in Billingsley. Blast, he had done it three times before, but later on I said to Billingsley, you know I don't mean it. But this time, he said it, Billingsley submitted his resignation in writing, and Cheek accepted it, and Billingsley was fired. So one Friday afternoon, five o'clock, after school was closed, Billingsley was fired. And somebody called me and said, Billings, what you told Billingsley has just happened. Now, that is reality. And so, we have never trained another city manager in the U.S. black since then. They have been trained as generalists, and they have become special assistants to the special assistants for, but no one has become a city manager since that time. Now, we need it the Department of Business and Public Administration. And we needed the $5 million, but we did not need to abolish the city management program in order to get the $5 million and to get the, the Department of Business and Public Administration. Now, that is the reality of black people in America. And that is what is done to us by our own <coughs> you understand that? All right. So, when I'm going through this exercise with you, it's not off the top of my head. I'm doing this based on experience. But you can't, if you don't understand the underlying principles, they can give you busy work. And you spend a lot of time exhausting yourself. And you get that. Let me give you another example to prove this. We had a thing here when we decided we were going to involve the community. And the mayor had a commission. And he had all these people. And they appointed a commission. And they had the right to sit and make policy. Community people appointed. But black people had never before sat on a policy-making board. And so we had the contract in Urban to train them. And you know what they told us? Just yes, sir, you're training us to make policy, but this can't be right. Black people don't make policy. We said, no, but have you read terms of reference? You are entitled to sit on the board, and the board makes Policy. They said, no, sir, it can't be true. <coughs> you know what happened? <coughs> they, not, this is the blacks now. Complain, so they took this contract away from us, gave it to UDC. The fellow at UDC, he was a hustler. The first lecture he told them, you don't have the authority to make policy. You know, they came back and told us, sir, I've been telling you all along that you are wrong, because we don't, the, the man at UDC tells us we don't have the authority to make, because they couldn't believe that they had the authority to make policy. Because we are not accustomed to making policy. We are accustomed to carrying out policy, not making policy. Right? So what I'm going through with you is to tell you that all pr programs and projects evolve logically from policy. If you understand the policy, you can deduct for yourself what will be the programs and the projects. If you don't understand the policy, 
you spend tremendous time and energy, like a fellow called Anthony. Anthony was the only person in the commission who was asking serious questions. He was over, what is that, um, on age three, whatever that word is. Eight and age. Six. Whatever that word is. You know what job they gave him? Every morning he had to wake up at five o'clock, go up and down the alleys counting number of broken windows and the number of dead rats. Remember in Washington, any of you here old enough to remember the Red of War on Rats? The Zappa Rat. Hmm? Yeah, it was the Zappa Rat campaign. Yes. Yeah. You remember that? Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> we actually had a thing called the War on Rats. Mm -hmm. And you had to go up and down the alley every morning at 5 o'clock, counting the number of broken <coughs> windows and the number of dead rats to see if the problem was. The, and I felt Anthony who was the sharpest community member on the board, used to ask serious questions. So the director, who was black, didn't like the idea of Anthony asking him questions. So he gave Anthony the job of counting broken windows and rats. And so when Anthony came to the board meeting, he was so exhausted, he fell asleep. And when the other members of the board tried to wake Anthony, the director said, don't wake him, let him sleep. And then they discussed all around Anthony, came to decisions, and after they had arrived at the, all the decisions, they woke Anthony and said, do you have anything to say? And by that time, it was too late. That is not, I'm not telling you theory. I'm telling you what happened in the D.C. government. Right? They give you busy work. You get exhausted. You are physical and intellectual, and you are contributing nothing. You get the feeling that you're doing something. So you're working so hard from 5 in the morning until 11 at night. But that is what you are doing has no impact on the society. If you want to have impact on the society, you have to intervene at the level of policy. <coughs> you understand that? All right. That is why I'm going through this preliminary thing before we get to transaction. Because I repeat, you cannot get anybody together if you are not together. You cannot be honest with other people if you cannot be honest with yourself. And many of us find it very difficult to be honest with ourselves, and hence we cannot be honest with others. We have been conditioned into competition. We want to compete with everybody, including members of your own team. You have to develop the ability to compete, but you have to know against whom do you compete. You do not compete against members of your own team. But that is part of what we have been conditioned to do, to compete against members of our own team rather than cooperating among ourselves to compete against our oppressors. You understand that? Mm -hmm. All right, now, that is where we are, and that is what the first two lectures so today, I want to build on that. And I want to deal with the question of honesty. Honesty to self and others. And in psychology, we do this, we have a thing called the Johari, J-O-H-A-R-I, the Johari window. 
the Johari window is like this. This is one. One is open to self. Open to others and close to self. Four is closed to self and others. No, please, if you don't do anything else, please pay, pay attention. Open to self and others. Suppose I came in this room right here now, the all of you, and I said to you, this whole exercise that we're going through is nonsense. It's an absolute waste of time. It is going to lead to nothing. It's useless, and you, you, you're wasting your money. To be here. What would be your what would you say to me in response? Yes, go ahead. I'll be the judge of that. Hmm? I'll be the judge of that. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. What would you say to me if I told you that? I don't agree with you. What is that it? Yeah, I don't agree with you. Okay. That's your opinion. Okay. It's a disrespect to you. Hmm? You're disrespecting yourself. Okay, all right. What would you say to that? I'm more in line with what she said. I, I, eh? I'm more in line with what she said at first. I'll be the judge. What did she say? Yeah, I'll be the judge of that. Uh, I'll be the judge of that. What would you say to that? I'll be, you know, I'll be the judge of that. Yeah. You're all being nice because you like me. <laughs> 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 the fact is, if I said that to you in this group, that's not what you think. You think something much more than that. But that's how human beings behave. When I say something like that, your first reaction is not intellectual. Your first reaction is emotional. And your thought is, that goddamn fool, I thought he, I thought he was bright. He must be dumb, he dumb as hell. You understand? Mm -hmm. But because you have grown to like me, you don't want to tell me that. So you have an emotional reaction, but you censor it. <coughs> and then you express it in words are polite and acceptable. I will be the judge of that. Let me think for myself. What you really said, that son of a bitch is not who we thought he was. <laughs> <coughs> right? No, that is the way human beings behave. We all do that. <coughs> the first reaction is totally emotional, but we censor that emotional reaction through reason, and we express it in a language that is acceptable. Right? So that all of us have learned that on the job that since we have to eat and pay rent and send our children to school, the boss says something to you that you don't like, right? And at the time when you're ready to tell him off, you smile. Mm. Is that right? And you say yes, 
when you mean no. You say, I am happy when you're mad. And if you can't bring yourself to happy, you say, let me think about it. Hmm? Let me think about it. And when somebody tells you total foolishness, you know what you say? I hadn't thought about that before. <laughs> That is a totally new concept to me. I had never heard that one. But let me go home and think it through. What you're really saying, that bullshit name, is foolishness. But you can't say that. Do you understand that? Yes. And when that has been done for three, four hundred years, it becomes normal. And natural to you. And you say it. And so that is why the Africans create a mask. How we all wear a mask. Particularly when we are dealing with the oppressor. When we are dealing with the oppressor, we never show our true face. We wear a mask. And the mask that we wear depends on how much we value survival. Mm -hmm. All right. right? Now, the problem is in human behavior that if you do something often enough to maintain your sanity, yes. you have to begin to believe it. Because among human beings, if you do something that you know is not right or true, it creates what we call cognitive dissonance. And if you create cognitive dissonance in a human being, that human being is on the first, has taken the first step to insanity. So in order not to move towards insanity, we have to resolve cognitive dissonance by telling ourselves that what we have said is true. And that is called a rationalization. When you act something out, you say something you don't believe, but after a while to maintain your sanity, to resolve cognitive dissonance, you begin to convince yourself it must be true. And you come up with all kinds of explanations to convince yourself, not anybody, yourself, that it, and that is what a rationalization is. But that is not peculiar to black people. That is true of all human beings. So the first whites who came up with the concept of white supremacy and black knew it wasn't true. They knew it wasn't true. But, uh, but since they were Christians, and Christian faith says, you can't do that to another human being, right? If they therefore define you as human beings, but then proceed to defile you, they will go insane. Say that again. Yeah? Say, make that statement again, please. Yes, I said they are Christians. Right. Christian faith said tells them you cannot defile another human being. If, therefore, they consciously defile you and admit that they are defiling you, they will go insane. So they have to rationalize that. And the way they rationalize is saying that you are not a human being, you're only three-fifths of a person. So that if a cockroach runs across this room and I stomp him, I ain't losing no sleep. <laughs> You understand? If I'm driving down the road 
and some animal that I've never seen before caught, and I hit him and I don't know what it is and I'd be slightly upset but I go and sleep but if I am a lover of cats and I hit a cat I'm in trouble I begin to worry if I'm a lover of dogs and I hit a dog and he dies I mean oh god if I hit a child I can't sleep If you're driving down the road and you hit a child and the child died, you can't sleep because you've hit and killed a human being. And that is true of all human beings. So when a human being tries to defile another human being, you have to come up with a rationalization and the rational is to make them non-human. Right. Right. So that is why when you're ready to go to war, any country on planet Earth, irrespective of color, race, anything, before they go to war, has to spend a series of months de demonizing the potential opponent. So that when the soldiers go on the field, you are not killing a human being. You are, kill, you are killing an apostle of the devil. If you are killing an apostle of the devil, that is permissible. You understand that? So what I'm trying to say to you, you cannot solve a problem unless you understand it. Racism, the American Psychological Association has been begging since 68 to define racism and white supremacy as a pathology. Because racism does not permit people to think rationally. If you start out from the assumption that one race is genetically superior to the other, and that you are the great, then you don't need to listen to them and therefore you cannot think rationally. That is what a pathology is. So don't believe that racism affects only black people. Right. So when Martin did what he did, not only did Martin free black, he also freed white people. Because even if you decide that you're not inferior, <clears throat> if white people continue to believe that they are superior, you have a problem. The problem can only be resolved when you decide you're not inferior and white people decide they are not superior. That is the only time the problem can be solved. Until both groups destroy the rationalization. And that is why Obama is in trouble. Because he's destroying the stereotype. Martin didn't destroy the stereotype. Malcolm didn't destroy the stereotype. Farrakhan has not destroyed the stereotype. This boy is destroying the stereotype. That is dangerous. You are now destroying the central pillar of belief of white people, mm -hmm. that they are genetically superior and you are genetically inferior. And they have pulled every trick on the book and the fellow has trumped them. No, we're not discussing his policies now. Eh? Okay. We're not discussing his policies now. I'm just talking about the inspiration of it, aspect of it. I'm talking about psychological aspect of it. Therefore, he, whether he knows it or not, he is in serious trouble. You cannot destroy the stereotype of a people. If you have spent your life achieving whatever you achieve, calling yourself successful, and at the age of 65, somebody tells you, everything that you did in life was wrong. Oh God, you can be go to pieces. How can you? You have defined yourself as a successful human being. 
and somebody comes along and tells you that everything you have done was wrong because your assumptions were wrong. You go to pieces and very likely will end up in a mental institution. That is what, that's why we can it is so difficult to have a decent conversation on race. Because people cannot, having been conditioned for 400 years into the belief of white supremacy, right? For you to tell them now that they're not superior. Because this is no see, the reason why the thing is so serious now, if racism was a conscious thing, you could deal with it. Because to be in the oh, racism is no longer conscious. It has moved from the conscious to the unconscious, and from the unconscious down into the subconscious. So the, the, the racists in America, honestly, most of them, don't, honestly to God, don't know that they're racist and do not believe that they are racist. So when I talk to them, they all admit that racism exists. And then I say to them, do you know a racist? They said, no. <laughs> no. Now, how can you have racism and not no have racism? Ra racism? But if you talk to them one on one, they will all admit that racism exists, but none of them know anybody who is racist. You understand? All right. Now, so what I'm saying, if you have gone through a certain conditioning over 14, four centuries, it is not easy to undo it. If you want to talk about getting rid of mental slavery. <coughs> the first thing we have to admit is that we have been conditioned for 400 years into mental slavery. And until we admit that, we can't get rid of mental slavery. We first have to admit that we have been conditioned into mental slavery. We have to understand what mental slavery is. Then we can begin to get rid of it. But whites have also been conditioned into mental slavery. But people don't know that. Because if they believe that they are superior, that is mental slavery. Because they're acting on a false assumption. The data does not support it. And so the conversation becomes very good. And so that's what open to self and to others means. One, you think something. And what you say to people reflects what you think. No, let me give you a perfect example of an idea like that. Because when you do counseling, you see this. I have seen so many marriages break up because the wife or the husband, whichever, wanted to be pleasing to the other. Right? The husband does something and the wife pretends it is okay. He does it the second time and she said, no problem. So he says, damn, my wife ain't upset about this. So I can continue doing it. But she didn't like it the first time. The damn sure didn't like it the second <laughs> time. Right? And by the third time, she's mad. But she suppresses that. And one day, you come home from work 10 minutes late, and she blocks. I am tired of waiting on you every evening. You're always late. And then you begin, well, darling, I've had a busy day. And the more you explain, the more angry she gets. Because you think she's reacting to the fact that you're 10 minutes late. That is not what she's reacting to. She's reacting to the thing that you've been doing something that she don't like. But she don't tell you that. You understand? And I have seen more marriages break up over that 
and over any other thing. We're, we do not tell the other people, others, what we truly think. Mm. If I believe something is pleasing to you, I will continue to try to please you by doing that thing which I think is pleasing to you. But if that thing, in fact, is not pleasing to you, I'm hurting the hell out of you without knowing it. And you are fooling me by pretending that you are pleased. You understand that? And this ain't got nothing to do with race or anything. That's human behavior. That is what is meant by open to self and to others. That what you think is what you say, what you tell people reflects your honest feeling. Now how many of us do that? How many do that? Even to our closest family and friends. But in a small group where you're planning to do serious work, if you don't do that, abolish the damn group. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's if you are planning to do serious work, and you cannot do that among each other, right. abolish the damn group. Because nothing, you have a bunch of traitors working against each other. If you cannot be honest to eat with each other in a small group, committed to something, abolish the group. You have to get to that point. He missed that. Hmm? This guy just missed that part because he belongs to a group. Mm -hmm. If you can repeat once, I please said, I'm serious. He needs to hear that. No, I'm serious. I'm, I'm saying yes. that when you belong to a small group, if you cannot be honest with the members of the group and tell them precisely what you think, let me give you a simple example. You're in a group. We're having something on Sunday at 2 o'clock. I need volunteers. And then you're going to say, well, I know all of you who are committed will be here. <laughs> no, you they put the people on the spot. Because everybody wants to pretend to, that they are committed. So everybody says, yes, sir, I'll be here. But there are two people who know they can't be here. Now, if they tell you I can't be here, you can make other arrangements. But if you think they're going to be here, you don't make other arrangements. And when the time comes, they're not here. But they knew from the beginning that they weren't going to be here. You understand? Yep. Now, if they had said to you, I would like to be here, but I have a previous commitment. I can't come. Next Sunday I can do it. Or if you do it on Monday, I can do it. But I can't do it at 2 o'clock. Even if you move it to 5 o'clock, I can do it. But I can't do it at 2 o'clock. Then you can make, you either you change the time, the day or the date, right? or you get somebody else. But if, if in order to go along with the group, Oh yeah, I'll be here. But, and they know damn well they won't be here. They know they won't be here. And that happens in organizations and groups. All the people commit to undertake tasks that they know in advance they cannot and will not perform. And you undermine the group. So that's what we mean by open to self and to others. You tell people the truth. If somebody says something to you that you don't like, you don't have to get nasty, you don't have to get rude, you don't have to get vulgar, but you must say, I don't like that. Please don't do it again. Then the person knows how they don't do that to you. But if you say, oh, that's nice, I like that, the people will do it again because you have lied to them. 
You have told them you like it when you don't. And wanting to be pleasing to you, they'll do it again. And then the more they do it, the more you get angry, until one day you explode. Right? Oppressor, you can't do it to you. <laughs> you can't tell the oppressor everything. But within your group, you have to be honest. And some people can't make that distinction. They say, well, if I'm honest, I'm honest all the time to everybody. You can't. If a slave is planning to escape, do you go to the master and say, master planning to escape tonight? Can you tell me the best way out? You understand? Do you do? But we doing that now, you know. Africa and the Caribbean, we do that. We run every day to the master saying, boss, we want to escape. Give us some money, you know. Draw us a map. Give us a road plan. Tell us how to tell us which road to take to get out. Mm -hmm. eh? And we claim that we're right. <laughs> Our great great grandparents were not permitted to go to school, but they wouldn't do that. When the slaves wanted to escape, they didn't go to the slave master and say, Master, we plan to escape tonight, you know. We want to leave at 10 o'clock. But we don't know the, the road. Can you give us, draw us a map and show us how to get out? Can you lend us $50? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, the slave just left. We are going every day to our masters, begging them to give us some money right. and give us a road map how to escape. Right. And we claim that we're bright. Hmm? Mm -hmm. right, now. Open to self and close. Go ahead. So open to self and to others. Mean that whatever you're thinking, whatever your feelings are, whatever you believe is known to you, and the same thing that is known to you is known to others. Open to self and close to others mean it is known to you but not known to others. That is to say you know what you think, you know how you feel, but the other people don't know. So that you know you're angry, but the boss thinks you're happy. So that is why history book says that there were no slave revolts because the slaves were all happy. Yeah. Because when the slaves saw the master, he going to say, Master, good morning, sir, I am so happy. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> so they, they, they believe that crap, and they go on the right history saying that there were no slave revolts because the slaves were so happy. Hmm? That is to say, the slaves knew how they, what they were thinking. They knew what they felt, but they did not communicate it to the masters. So they knew, but the masters did not know. For us, open to self, close to others. Right? The third one is open to others, but close to self. Open to others and close to self means that you are doing something that is known to others but not known to you. Now, is that possible? Yes, for sure. Hmm? sure. Let me give you an example. I used to, when I was up until when I was there, I used to go home in the evening when I was going through this thing with Chief and these people. I, I never told my wife about it because she had enough problems. And I would go home very upset after tense day. And I could never figure out, as soon as I walked through the door, she would say to me, what happened today? Why are you so upset? And I thought I was cool. <coughs> you know, I thought I was very calm. I thought I was very relaxed. And I could not figure out how 
Every time my wife would just say to me, what happened to you today to make you so upset? And so eventually I had to stop and give serious thought and then I discovered that when I'm upset, I don't know if I still do it, I'm not sure if I still do it, but I used to, when I was upset, I used to do that. A simple thing as that. I would be talking to you and unconsciously I would just do that. And so whenever I'm talking to her, I did that. She knew I was upset. I didn't know I was doing that. You understand that? Mm -hmm. So I was close, it was close to self, but open to others. Other people who knew me knew that when I was upset, I scratched my head. I didn't know that when I was upset, I scratched my head. And so I was communicating to people, and they were knowing the truth when I was trying to deny it. That is what is meant by open to others and close to self. You are doing, you are communicating something which is understood by others and not understood by you. Now the fourth one is close to self and others. That is to say, you don't know what the hell you believe, nobody knows. No, at that point, don't come to see me. Go see a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. I can't help you. At that point, you're ready for the psych to need psychoanalysis. I can't deal with you at that point. That is insanity. And a lot of us are either there or close, you know. <laughs> a lot of us are either there or close because we have we played the game so long. We have played it. We, we don't know truth from honesty anymore. We don't know right from wrong. We don't know good from bad. We're not sure. We are totally confused. Huh? Close to self and all. That is where we are now. So, is there a paper thing I can use just to wipe? This one? Right. Yes. Oh, 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 oh. What kind of student is she? Behind. Close the cell. Yours. Correct. Is that okay? I think it's used to. She just destroyed it. Magic world, Have you got it on the camera? No. You know, when you're in medical school, every medical student, whatever disease they are studying, they have it. Whatever the disease is that you're studying, at the time when you're studying that disease, you think you have it. Because most mm. of us, as human beings, have some of the symptoms of everything. It is worse in psychology. When in psychology, when you're studying mental disorders, it's a frightening thing. <laughs> Because when you list the symptoms of mental disorder, <laughs> every human being has those symptoms. The question is to what extent mm -hmm. and how you order, how they are ordered. And so if you do a study, you will find that a large percentage, of, not so much undergraduate, graduate students in psychology end up in mental institutions. <laughs> You understand that? This is true, you know. When I was in school, my professor, I had a professor called Max Minez, oh, yeah. German Jew. Yeah. Well, excellent, really brilliant man. And we were doing clinical psychology. And St. Elizabeth was a mental hospital. And so once a month, we used to go to St. Elizabeth as a practical. And this day we went to St. Elizabeth, 
And of course, there are a number of former graduate students in, as patients at St. Elizabeth. Let, let me go further and, and say this so that you understand. In those days, blacks like now and now were in denial. They didn't want to believe that their problem was due to racism. So you went to work in the government. You had a BS degree and you were made a communication specialist. That meant messenger. <laughs> <laughs> and that meant, right? Though it's great. The salary was $3,750 a year. When you became chief specialist, meaning head messenger, they made 4250 Now it's not as bad as it sounds, because in those days you could buy a house, a nice house, for fourteen, twelve to $14,000. The top professor at Harvard, Ali and Locke, E. Franz and Fraser, were making $10,000. The number two, Eugene Holmes, was making $7,500. The $10,000 at that time could buy what $100,000 buy now, right? No. These fellows graduated with a BS degree, they were made messengers. And there were these white, nothing but a high school degree, at the same grade, same grade. Then they said to them, that is because you're not sufficiently educated. So they came back and they did a master's degree. When they did a master's degree, they were moved from messenger to chief messenger. The high school white had gone on to something else. So they came back and they did a PhD. And when they did the PhD, they were moved from the lower level of chief messenger mm -hmm. to the higher level of chief messenger. But they could no longer tell themselves, it is because I'm not educated, because there's no degree higher than the PhD. At which point, they had to admit to themselves this is racism, which they had refused to admit before. And when confronted with the reality, they went off. They couldn't deal with it. So we had a lot of that in St. Elizabeth. And this is a true story. We go to St. Elizabeth this day, and one of our former students spots Dr. Minas. He said, Professor Minas, come, come. I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. So Minas says to me, come with me. So I walk with Minas. And the fellow puts his hand around his mouth. He said, Dr. Minas, I don't want anybody to hear this. But you see that fellow over there? He mad. <laughs> <laughs> so Minas, you know, very cool. And why do you think that he's mad? He said, Prof, don't ask me any questions. Just take my word for it. That, that fellow over there is mad. Mina says, but I need more evidence than that. Why are you insisting he's mad? He said, well, Prof, he keeps telling everybody that he's the son of God. <laughs> Mina says, so what? He could be. He said, no, Prof, he's not. I never told him he was my son. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making that up. Eh? That is a fact. That actually happened. Right? The moral of the story 
if you enter into a conversation with a madman, <laughs> who is mad? <laughs> hmm? If you decide, no, suppose me, this and I, I spent the next hour trying to convince the man that they, and he also mad. Who would have been mad? Right. <laughs> yeah. So all Mina said, now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I understand. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we both walked away and he was happy. Mm -hmm. And everybody was happy. Right? Because you can't resort to rational discourse with a person who is totally irrational. Oh, no. It sounds like some of my best friends. <laughs> no, what I'm telling you is. I said, yes, the air condition should bring water. This woman is crazy. No, it's all right. They, air condition. Right no, now. listen. People are sweating. I, I, we need an air condition. Who's on the roof? Who's on the roof? God? The joke is the sun. going up <laughs> The sun is up in there. Right. Oh, but what we're saying now is this is that don't be too hard on yourself. Every human being has all four of these things in your way, excluding nobody. Every human being has all of those four things in your makeup. The question is, Proportions, right? So that then drink water quickly, guys. It's too hot. Water is good. Okay, that's right. It reverses um, blood pressure. No. What I'm saying, look here now. Remember what I just drew. If you have a makeup like this, right? Mm. And this. Where this is the dominant, one is the dominant, that is open to self and others. That is normal. Most of us are like that. This, this is smaller, this is smaller, and this. This is very small, right? Then you can have another combination like this, right? Where this is small, right? This is small, this. That's a different kind of human being. See what I'm saying? All right? You can have another combination in which this is small, this is small, this is small, and this is large. See that? Remembering what these are, eh? Mm -hmm. This is open to self and others, right? Open to self, to others. Close to self, but open to others. Close to self and others. I'm not going to write that in anymore. Then you can have the fourth combination, which is like this. This person needs psychiatric care. Sure. You understand? Know mm. Now, all of us as human beings fit into one of these four categories. The only question is which one? No. If you were free to choose your friends, 
Which one would you want to be your friend? One, two, three, four. Which would you prefer to be your, your friend? Eh? This one. Yeah. Because they're honest, they'll tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker. Other people think the same thing about you. We, everybody would prefer our best friends to be like this. Hmm? Other people also would prefer their best friends to be like this. You now, when you go home, your exercise is stand in front of a mirror and talk to the person in the mirror and ask them in the mirror, knowing you as well as I do, would I want you to be a close friend? Don't come and tell me, I don't want to know. That is between you and yourself. And I'm deadly serious about it. Go home and close the door and stand in front of a mirror and speak to the person in the mirror and say, I know you as much as you know yourself. And knowing you as well as I do, would I or would I not want you to be a close personal friend? And the answer to that will tell you whether or not you need to do something about your life. I'm not asking you to come back and tell the group. I'm not asking you to come back and tell me. I'm asking you to be honest with yourself. If you cannot be honest with yourself, you cannot be honest with anybody else. And if you're planning to work in a group on serious matters, you need to develop the ability to be honest with yourself so that you can be honest with the other members of your group. And the exercise is to speak to the person in the mirror and ask that person, knowing you as well as I do, would I want you to be a close person? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I will never ask you what you answer was, but I expect you to do it. And I expect you to be honest with yourself. And I expect you to make a decision as to the amount of change that is required in your life. Okay? Now, that's, that one is not easy. But it has to be done. Okay? You, I would, I, mm -hmm. I would suggest that you do it buck naked. No, I ain't telling them how to do it. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm saying that in, in, for real because clothes have a way of, of, of hiding the identity and the true self. Makeup has a way. All, those, the, all these other external things have a way of doing it. And I think if you stand up in front of the in front of a mirror, buck naked, there's there's another way than if you stand up fully clothed. Doctor Ashman, uh, Walter Mosley said the same thing. I I, I believe that he strongly. I have recommend. Movie. I've done it, and I've recommended it to my children and the other young people. Mm -hmm. You stand up buck naked in front of that mirror, and well, you really, I'm really, sure. there's so many dimensions of yourself that you're looking at. Well, I'm finished telling you that I'm telling you that. <laughs> because we have had cases of people who did that and went off. I went crazy. Didn't yes. come back out. I didn't and come back off. out. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, hear you. I hear you. Because when you go to that extent, yeah. it reveals everything. That's right. And a lot of you can can't deal yeah. with it. Yeah. Do you think that any person could ever go through that exercise and no matter what they come out with, think that they are done, that there is no work to be done? Or? Yes, yes. It's the beginning. Those people, there are people, there's a little bit self confidence and arrogance. Arrogant people can do that. 
Bush could do that. <laughs> but Bush has that great big section down there on the right mm -hmm. in that little corner. Mm -hmm. His is like, takes up all of his space almost. No, but he don't know the reality. No, the man is totally <laughs> divorced from reality. Yeah. He's not in touch with reality right. at all. He says he's a divine human. He operates on a syllogism. It's very simple. So Bush is not stupid. You have to understand. He operates on it. He says, People who are divinely ordained cannot be wrong. You know? I am divinely ordained. I am divinely ordained, therefore I can't be wrong. So anything he says is right. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get to that stage, you know, you're dealing with a different kind of thing. People who think, see, one of the things in life is to be self confident without being arrogant. There's a very thin line between self-confidence, but most people cross the line. When they become self-confidence, self they also become arrogant, because they cross the line. Mm -hmm. If you tell me I'm right, I ain't got no problem with that. The world is full of right people. If you tell me I'm the only right person on planet Earth, then I have a problem. Because it means you can't take advice from anybody, you don't need to listen to anybody, so you are sick. <coughs> but there are a large number of people on planet who are very arrogant without cause. You're right. That is the <laughs> problem. <You're right. laughs> no, there are some people who are arrogant with cause, mm -hmm. because they're bright. Right. They're gen like these scientists and all that kind of thing. Space, uh, they're bright. And when they tell you, and if they get carried away and think that nobody else could do it, they're still off, but you know, you can forgive that. But when a bush <laughs> thinks that he's the brightest thing on planet Earth, that is arrogance without cause. You understand? But we won't get into that. Oh, yeah, let's no. come back. No. Let me go to something else. Because when you do that exercise, that is stressful. That exercise is stressful. And the question is, how do human beings react to stress? A lot of us have not learned to deal with stress. Stress comes in many forms. And in recent, over the last 15 years, there's a lot of work being done on stress. The psychological, the interplay of the psychological and the physiological. What changes take place in the body when you're under stress? What chemical changes take place? And tremendous advance has been done. But without going into the details, what we know is this. Stress can mimic every disease known to mankind. And depending on your genetic structure and your environmental conditioning, stress can react, cause you to react in different ways. That's what we call psychosomatic ailments. I'm sorry? Psychosomatic. Psychosomatic ailments. So there are some people, when they're under stress, secrete excess of acid yeah. in their stomach. And they get ulcers. I'm one of those. If I get under tremendous stress, I secrete excess acid in my stomach. And I tend to develop ulcers. M Michael Manley was like that, and that's how he developed all the ulcers that he had. But when he was under stress, he secreted excess acid and developed all kinds of ulcers. You can get pain in your joints, pain in your knees, pain anywhere. And the worst case, it can affect your circulation and therefore give you a heart attack. Stress can mimic any disease known to humankind. 
and there is no way to avoid stress if you live on planet Earth. You can't avoid it. You're going to be subjected to stress in some form or the other. The question is, how do you react to stress? The first general reaction is fight. Most people when placed under stress, abandon reason and they want to fight. I mean physically fight. The difference is the degree of fight. Some will want to just fight you with a fist, some will want to stab you, some will shoot you with a gun. Right? So be careful how you place people under stress. We have a saying now in, in America, the fellow went postal. <laughs> we know that, eh? Yeah. Right. Because we have people who have worked for 25, 30, 40 years, and the day before they're due for retirement, you fire them two days before so that they, they can't get the money. The fellow's worked all his life, he has children, family, and you organize to fire him two days before he qualifies for his pension. And he come back with a gun and he shoot everybody. Hmm? Now there was a time when children were not subjected to that much stress, but now they are being subjected and so we find children going to school and shooting everybody. Fight. The second category, most often, is flight. Right? Flight. And flight can be physical or psychological. Flight can be physical or psychological. That is to say, when I talk like this to certain groups, people will sit and at a certain point they can't take it anymore and they get up and literally leave the room. They can't deal with the truth. And in order not to harm me, right, because they would like to shoot me, but since they don't want to shoot me, they get up and physically leave the room. That is flight. There's also psychological flight. Where you can sit around the table and listen, and when you can deal with it, first thing that happens, you sit down and out of while you start. And you shift and, you, and then you do that. The next thing you know, you close your eyes and you block it out. You don't physically move, you psychologically remove yourself. So that if you have a circle, if you have a circle, people with, who are sitting in the circle, when the stress gets too great, will move their chair back out of the circle so as not to be in the circle. That is to say to themselves, I am not a part of this crowd. <laughs> you know, I can't take it, but I don't want him to know that. So I'm going to move. And you simply push the chair back, mm -hmm. right? And you move yourself out of the circle. A psychological flight. All of us know the ultimate form of psychological flight is denial. Denial. <coughs> yes. I go to a meeting with a chairman of a board of a corporation, and his chief of staff is with him. And something comes up, 
And after we present the data, chairman of the board says, but I didn't know that. Nobody ever told me that. He turns to his chief of staff, who is being paid $250,000 a year. And he says to his chief of staff, as soon as I get back to the office, you're fired. No, he wasn't serious, right? But the chief, but he said it with a straight face. Now here's a man making two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and his boss tells him at a conference table, as soon as we get back to the office, you are fired. So when the meeting is over, I wait for him at the door and I block him, and I say to him. You sure you want to go back to the office? <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm waiting to see how it went. Right. He said, sure. I said, but if you go back to the office, yeah. you're going to be fired. Didn't you hear what your boss? He said, no, no, my boss didn't say that. No, everybody heard <laughs> his boss say that. Right? He said, no, no, no. You misunderstood what he said. He never said that. Because he cannot deal with the fact that his boss said, as soon as you get back to the office, you will be fired. Because he can't afford to lose $250,000 a year. Because he's mortgaged, he lives in a big house, has four cars, children in school. If he lose that job, he's in trouble. So he just locks the thing out and says, and insist, he said, my boss, no, you misunderstood. He, everybody else at the table heard what his boss said. Now, that's an extreme case. You understand? So we have fight, we have flight. Flight can be physical, or flight can be psychological. Now, these are the two main reactions to stress. When we therefore look in the ghetto, and we see what is going on in the ghetto, why are we surprised? <laughs> we have people in the ghetto who either deny their reality or who are killing each other. Because they don't live on the stress sometime. They live on the stress every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Now the question therefore is, how do we relieve their stress? Yes, darling. If you said it's the only the basic two ways or the only two No, 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 no. I'm coming to the third. Okay. I, I said those are the two okay. that occur most often. Okay. Okay. Those are the okay. two that occur most often. Those two. The third one is what is called coping. sophisticated. Because coping now requires to use reason. These two involve emotion. Somebody do something, you get angry, you shoot him. You stab him. You fight him. You knock him out. Do something. That's why the old people said, used to say, when reason fails, brute force will prevail. When reason fails, brute force will prevail. Hmm? Coping requires the use of reason. When you sit down and talk to the people, it, it assumes that you are capable of communicating and the other person is capable of understanding at a rational level. Right?
Now one has to be careful about coping. Because there's a difference between coping and selling out. And some people interpret coping to mean selling out. And let me give you a practical case. Again, I, I'm not giving you a textbook. You won't find these things in a textbook. I used to do training of teachers. And the teachers' union had a problem with the DC school board. And they appointed a lady who was president of the teachers' union to take their case to the school board. But the person who was in charge of the school board knew the head of the teachers' union and knew her psychological makeup. She was fundamentally a social climate about promoting self. So you have to be very careful with these people who pretend that they're about promoting the group when they're about promoting self. So she went and they selected her and I said to them, are you sure you want that lady to represent you. They say, yes, she's the president, so she has to represent. I said, think about it. They came back and said, yes. We said, I said, all right, fine. That's your decision. So she went to the meeting, to the head of the school board. And this is what the school, head of the school board did. When she arrived, she said, before we start the meeting, I want to talk to you. I have an opening here for an assistant school superintendent, and we are considering you. I know you're head of the teachers' union, but what they're demanding is absurd. And surely you cannot believe in that. She said, but that is up to you, because you're the president. And she said, okay, let's start the meeting. And she starts the, the meeting. And this lady lays out the case of the teachers. And after she lays out the case, she says to the superintendent, but I don't believe it. <coughs> but as president, I'm obliged to tell you what they think. You see, she's separating herself now. Yeah? As the head of the union, I'm obliged to tell you what, but I don't personally believe it. But since I'm the president, I have to tell you. Because the lady has told her she has a job waiting for her. So that is selling out. Right? Now there's another example which demonstrates coping. You go to the head of superintendent and you say, we need to have in this school, this program. You sit and they show you the budget. This may be, you're going there in March. The budget has been set from the year before. They show you the budget and there is no money in the budget for the program for this year. You're in March. And it doesn't matter how much you march, it doesn't matter how much you shout, it doesn't matter what you do, they cannot introduce the program this year because there is no money. But the superintendent says to you, I agree with you that you need this program. I will make the commitment that in the coming budget, right, I will put the money in for this project, and so you will have it next year. Right? You look at it and you realize there's no point marching, demonstrating, because don't care what I do, it's not going to happen this year. But you say to the superintendent, if it doesn't happen next year, 
then we will be marching and demonstrating. In other words, you don't violate your principle. You don't say, I don't need the program. You don't say, I don't believe that we need the program. You say, we need the program, but inasmuch as you have shown me the factual data that it is impossible to introduce a program this year, I am willing to compromise and say to you, we will wait until next year. But if you don't do it next year, then we're coming at you. You understand what I'm saying? So in one case, in the first case, the person sold out because she denied a commitment to the principle. She denied the validity of the principle, and she went over on the other side. In the second case, the person stands with the principle, right? But is amenable to objective data, and therefore is willing to postpone the implementation for another year or two. Mm -hmm. You understand? All right. So, I'm saying when we talk about coping, we have to differentiate between selling out, right, right, and rational outcome. In the case of selling out, there is a desertion of principle. In the case of rational outcome, one sticks with the principle. But you delay the implementation based on rational data. So, which means you have to talk to people. If you have a conflict with somebody, Unless you're willing to fight or fight, flight, take flight or fight, you have to sit and talk with the person. So when the president of a country tells you, I will never speak to my opponent, what are you talking about? How can you not speak? How can you resolve a problem without speaking to your opponent? You don't need to speak to people who are on the same side with the person you need to speak to is your opponent. That is coping. Now, coping takes many forms. That right? takes many forms. If, it, if you find out that you're too stressed by it, you go to a psychiatrist. Now, black people don't like to go to psychiatrists mm -hmm. because it, if, if your neighbor see you're going to a psychiatrist, you're going to say, boy, you mad. <coughs> and you can't go back into the area. <laughs> no, white people, if they don't go to a psychiatrist, people think something is wrong with them. <laughs> Particularly white females. White females just love to be able to come to office and tell you in great detail, I visited my psychiatrist and he told me this and I told him. I have never seen nothing like this in my life. <laughs> they, just, they enjoy telling you about their visits to their psychiatrist. Black people don't like. I have a friend who is a psychiatrist, went back to Jamaica and made the mistake of putting up a sign psychiatrist. <laughs> oh God, for three months, not a patient came. <laughs> he had to take down the damn sign and go work with his brother. <laughs> and became a general practitioner. And when he became a general practitioner, people flowed because they're comfortable with him because he's trained, you see. But he never tells anybody that he's a psychiatrist because because black people can't be mad, can't afford to be called mad. <laughs> mad as hell, you know. <laughs> no, that's reality. <clears throat> See, you understand? Mm -hmm. All right. So, and again, I'm saying to you, please understand, this is not true of black people or brown people. This is true of human beings. So whites today, who believe that God ordained them to rule the world, who find their population shrinking, and who find their dominance threatened are on the extraordinary 
stress. The question is, what do they do? A bush? This is bush. Bush wants to fight everybody. Hmm? They say Obama can't be elected because he, being black, may take flight. <laughs> hmm? Where is he going? Don't know. Okay. It don't matter. He did already. You see? But now they want somebody. And coping for them means that this man must be bright enough to bamboozle everybody in the world mm -hmm. and get them to do what he wants them to do. You understand? That's why I see Obama. Then. So when you it's see... Totally yeah, you understand? Obama to cope his, yeah. Go ahead, we understand. No, I'm just saying that when you see this, this is not applying to what to white, except as human beings. Right. And you need to understand what you are observing. When you see Bush talking about preemptive action and all of this, this is nothing more than fight. His reaction to stress, because whites are under stress. Their numbers are shrinking and they're losing control of planet Earth. And that's what I mean when I say the city is dangerous and sophisticated. Because what they would like you to do is to give them the opportunity to engage in fight because they are equipped to eliminate you. If this doesn't work, they want to scare you so that you take flight and surrender. Now, the question is, how do you cope? <coughs> what programs and what formulas do you develop so you don't give them the opportunity to shoot you down. Two, you don't just withdraw into a corner and die by psychological flight, mm -hmm. but you cope. That is to say, you develop activities and programs to outmaneuver them. But you first have to decide which of these things you want. Because a lot of your people say, Let's go shoot them down. Let's burn it down. After you burn it down, what happens? Hmm? Or others will say, boy, this is too much. I can't deal with it. I'm just going to go along with the program. You know, like some of us have been doing. Colin, for example. Look at McKellen, who just wrote this book. Perfect example. But he was in the way. The man clearly, while he was in the White House, was under stress. He knew he was lying, but he needed a job, he needed a status to say, I'm the White House press secretary. But now that he's out, he writes a book telling you what happened. Why didn't he do it before? Because he was not prepared to fight, so he took flight. It is only now that he's removed from the stress that he can begin to cope by telling the truth and rehabilitating himself. You understand? A lot of our people are engaged in the thing. Which do we do? Do we go along in order to get along or do we resist? Right? That is to say, do we fight? Do we take flight, or do we do the more difficult thing, which is thinking things through rationally and developing programs to cope with the situation? <coughs> that takes a lot of work. Coping requires a tremendous amount of, of work. And people don't like, and for example, if you believe that the problem is going to be solved in a week, you ain't going to go for coping. Because ain't no, no existing problem in the world is going to be solved in a week. And if you're not prepared for the long haul, then the chances are you ain't going to fight because if you start the fight, you're going to be eliminated in, in a month. So it's going to be very short. 
what you will end up doing is taking flight. And one of the problems I'm having is that I talk to young people, they're telling me, if Obama don't win, we either we're going to burn the damn same place down, or we're going to withdraw. Because after all the effort we have made, if he doesn't win, it means there's nothing that we can do, and I'm just going to withdraw and drop out, which is the worst thing that could happen. So there has to be a group of people who understand this, and to understand that struggles move forward step by step. And you do not, though you may not have reached the ultimate goal, you have made pr progress. The responsibility is on you to carry it forward like a relay race. So if Obama does not win, don't say I'm withdrawing. Keep moving forward. Because Obama, the problem right now is that we, the serious problem, Obama, like Jesse, has seriously decided that he can become president. He honestly to God now believes he can become mm -hmm. president. And not about his supporters, not about him as a human being. He honestly believes he can become president. He's rational enough to know that in order to become president, he needs the vote of a significant percentage of white people. You cannot win. If, he, if, if all the Hispanics and all the blacks voted for him and all the whites voted against him, he would lose. Right? All right. So having decided he wants to be president, as a practical political matter, he has to begin to say things not to alienate the whites, but to win them over. He has made, therefore, three speeches recently, which are frightening. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very frightening. He had a conference call on Latin America and the Caribbean, and he was told that Latin America and the Caribbean are in total agreement that the embargo on Cuba should be lifted. And that if he's talking about change and he's serious, he has to advocate the lifting of the embargo on Cuba. But in the speech, he specifically says he will not lift the embargo on Cuba. He says it will be maintained. Because white people, that's what they want to hear. And he should have said it just like that. You understand? All right. Then we go to the Middle East. And he <coughs> wrote that speech on Latin America. Where? Florida. In Miami, in front of the Cuban Americans. In Miami. So he could say nothing else. If he hadn't said that, he might never come out alive. Right? Then. He goes before the Jewish group and he makes a commitment to Israel firmer than any other president has ever made. He made an absolute commitment to Israel without mentioning the Palestinians as if the Palestinians don't exist. Again, if he wants to win the white vote, that is what he has to say. Do you understand? Now, in his last thing on when he won South Dakota, he made a speech in which he made he repeated what he had said earlier. I am in favor of free trade and globalization. Now anybody who knows policy knows the primary objective of American policy is global dominance. And the two major strategies for achieving global 
dominant, is free trade and globalization. And he has now gone on record saying he's in support of both of those things. So that the Washington Post had to write an editorial saying that when it comes to the Middle East, he's no different from Bush. Mm -hmm. Worse is the fact because you, Bush retracted, you know, Bush is now making his embassy move to Jerusalem. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's saying Jerusalem is yes. just, you know, the right. capital right. of Israel. So I'm saying what is happening is Obama is now caught on the horn of a dilemma. <coughs> I don't know what his personal views are. Because, because in politics, very often what you say is not your personal view. At the level of practical politics, you have to say that which will cause you to win. And I'm saying those three things that I have quoted are if he is to win, he has to say those three things. He cannot win if he does not say those three things. There's no way he can win if he doesn't say those three things. Now, if he decides right, that he don't care about winning, winning is not number one, he can negate those three things. But if he has decided that I must win, then he has to say those three things. Now, the question is, whether he believes it or not at this point, will he come to believe those three things that he has said? Because if he comes to believe those three things, right? Then master, if I am going to be oppressed, let me be oppressed by my oppressor and not by the agent of my oppressor. You understand? Right? But this is again, in the final analysis, it's an individual choice. Because he is in a hell of a position. If he takes a position on behalf of the Palestinians, if he says he's going to lift the embargo on Cuba, if he says he's not in agreement with free trade and global, he cannot win. Because those are the foundations of US policy. If he wants to win, he has to say those three. But if he says those three things, then his thing about change is meaningless. It's to think in terms of systems rather than events. Because we have a habit, we have a habit of reacting to singular events. Right? Is that peculiar to us as people or no, 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 no. to us? No, 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 darling. No, okay. no, 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 no. That's human? Yes, under pressure. People under pressure can't afford People under pressure live from day, day to day. Okay. You don't have the time, energy, or resources to deal with the big thing. But if you want to change the system, you have to understand and deal with the big thing. Mm -hmm. right? Now, if, if you were not a part of this group, I wouldn't give you this lecture. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't be setting out to change. But we, eventually, we are here to talk about Pan-Africanism. If you're going to talk about Pan-Africanism, then that is a systemic thing we're talking about. So you have to understand this. See? This is not an undergraduate course, you know. <laughs> this is a graduate course. All right, now. The other thing we want to talk about is violence. It's what? It's what? Violence. Violence. And understanding the dynamics of violence.
Let's talk for a little bit, for a few minutes, but very brief, on the dynamics of violence. You have worked on a job for 20 years. You are supposed to get a pension, health insurance, something. You have a wife who gets sick. You have two young children. Right? And you say, okay, no, no problem, because on this job I have a pension coming and I have health insurance, so I'm going to be able to take care of my wife and my two children. And then, Suddenly, you get a notice saying we are downsizing and you are fired. Yeah? You have to be downsizing. And you go in on a Friday morning, and at 10 o'clock, or 12, they give you a send a notice saying, as of today, your employment ceases. But you still stay cool, because you have a pension coming, you have insurance coming, but you have a sick wife and two children. So on Monday morning, your goal now is to get the money due to you from your pension and your health care. That's your goal, right? Your you go, and when you go here, the person receives you and says to you, you came to the wrong office. You're in the wrong place. Right? So you get upset. Right? In other words, on the way to your goal, you encounter a blockage. That's the first blockage. She says to you, go over here. That is the right place to go. But it is now 3 o'clock and they close at 3. So there's no point going there today. No, you just lost your job, yeah? So you, <laughs> a gas is four dollars a gas. A gallon. So tomorrow morning, you get up and you drive to this new place. And you sit, you get there early, and nobody calls you until three o'clock in the afternoon but you are prepared to sit down and wait. When they call you at 3 o'clock, they say yes. But the person who deals with that is on vacation. <laughs> hmm? So you encounter the second block, right? And this now leads to frustration. And then they tell you, the person who deals with this is on vacation, no, is, is no longer in this office. They have moved over to this other office. But I think they may be uh, on vacation. Right? So you go back home, 
And we get them upset now. So the next day, you ride over to this place, right? You don't want to go 10 o'clock because if the line are too long, but no point going early. Let me just go at 2 o'clock. So you go at 2 o'clock. You sit down, and at 3.30 they call you, and you tell them what I'm saying. Oh, you need to see Miss Jones. Yeah, I'm here to see. Oh, Miss Jones is on vacation, and she's out of the country. Miss Jones is not only on vacation, she's out of the country. And you have a sick wife and two children, and they have your pension and your health care. And you ain't got no money. And at this point, frustration changes to anger. Now, how many of you would get angry before? Some of you might not take that long to get angry. But the average person takes three blocks before they get angry. It takes three blocks before you get angry. Now, consider people who have been enc encountering blocks every day of their life for a long time. And then people wonder, why are these people angry? Hmm? You have been working. You just lost your job. And in three days, after encountering three blocks, you get angry. And you wonder why people who have been encountering blocks every day of their lives for years are, ha are angry. That is the dynamics of, of violence. That when the individual is blocked from achieving their goal, there is a constant increase in emotion based upon the amount of blockage encountered. And that First reaction is upset, then frustration, and then anger. And this anger, at first, can be mild anger, but eventually becomes violent anger. And again, let's go back to what I talked about stress. At that point, you get one of two reactions: and <coughs> flight. Or fight. You see how these things are linked? Hmm? You see how they are linked? So that when you get to that point, some people just, just give up. They become alcoholic. They become drug addicts. Hmm? They withdraw. They go mad. All kinds of. They withdraw in all kinds of ways. Others go berserk and destroy everything inside. And the anger can take the form of a riot, a demonstration. And that's why you go to the demonstration, and people go to the demonstration planning to be very mild. And when, when they get to the demonstration, all of a sudden, if you see them, you can't believe it is the person that you know. They, they start shouting and carrying on because all the emotion, all the frustration begins to show. And then we, who are not in that position, say, how could they, how could these uncouth, uneducated, unsophisticated behave in such an irrational manner? If it happened to you, you would do the same damn thing. Remember? That is the dynamics. And as you see, they all link. Things feed into each other. Now, there's much more to it. As I keep telling you, I'm summarizing these things. I'm summarizing these things. But I'm trying to expose you to the principles 
So you understand we are talking about human behavior. And please understand the same thing so that the person, the white person, who is trying to achieve global dominance, understand this now, the white person who is committed to achieving global dominance, as they encounter blockages to achieving that, they go through this same process. Yes, yes. Well, uh, since I first let you I think, uh, for me, before I, my comment, I want to just say that I think we need to, in the next class, we need to revisit uh, what's dubbed as revolutionary violence or collective violence or organized violence against irrational obstacles, series of irrational obstacles. And I think if we can start with that, I have no, I'm going, I'm flowing good. Personally, I don't know in your questions you have to bring what you have to bring, but let me just say a few things. I really think, you know, I'm like sitting here and I'm like literally bamboozled because when I proposed to uh, Professor Leo, I was abstract, pan Africanism. And brick by brick, cell by cell, he's constructing the things we always forget. And I sat here today and I was just like, in the 40 years of my knowledge of struggle that I saw people, not that I was an activist or anything, but I saw the Black Panther Party's defective nature, what brought it down. I saw the Black Power Movement. I saw the Black Liberation Movement, the Muslim Movement, the African War of Independence, the Mozambique, you know, once Cabral got a who I thought had the most profound element that he interjected in the African liberation movement, the cultural component, was completely dead with him. And so the Nkrumahs, like once we glory the Nkrumah, but we go into the critical analysis of organizations, how they broke down, are the things we always neglected, or our elite neglected, fundamentally, the issue of psychology and human relationship and social organizations and the individual character into the collective because we just took the collective without knowing who are these individuals who come into the collective organization. So we know now people who sold Nkrumah, who spied on him, were black by skin, but by state of mind, you know, some other planet, Martians. <laughs> now, and then you go into the whole idea of Sociology. I was. I just took him as like I've heard him many times. You know, I'd like Pan Africanist brother, but he's going break, breaking down sociology and the sociological implication of struggle, which we all, you know, I I am receptive because this is what we have to learn to write script. The sociological aspect, the physical aspect, the the psychological, and most of the times nobody get cares to read the literature of Richard Wright in this kind of you know, stratifications. And so we don't look at our leaders not to bring them down. We leave, we leave uncritically and, uh, and un without analyzing our movement. What we do is we give to voodoo theory of tearing down our visionaries. To defend our visionaries is to understand where the weak links. And the weak links, they understood economic, the importance of education, they understood the importance of hospital, we can see people, they took the Pan-African movement, took doctors, etc. But really, they never went into the psychological, sociological aspect of the individual as he or she comes into the collective. And I really appreciate you because you started constructing what I think is fundamental and defective. And I'm writing a script called Independent Road on, on really Africa, and it's helping me a great deal, just listening, because I'm going to the cell problem, the cells that come together because we always ignore the cell, taking the collective, trusting the collective mm -hmm. has come for the same mission, when in fact we bring different psychological and social cultural context. Now, having said that, I was surprised because when he gave us the outline, you know, I say, I said, brother, what is he doing? Is what I was saying silently. Again, you know, that thing he did, the analyzing. But you know, I know he's doing something crazy here and he's going for something. I trusted 
where he was going, but I'm not going to lie to you, understood, no. He was going to the family, children, raising, relationships, you know, men, women, relationships, if you go to SNCC, you know, the whole shit that busted out on the human relationship, on black people who went on the same mission, you know, the whole idea of the, the psychological demented aspect of black manhood and the obsessive want of whiteness, not the person, but the skin, how that contributed into the relationship of many black women who were disgruntled and wrote so many books to this day, you know, you know, exhaling on us, you know, waiting to exhale, but really exhaling on all of us. We, we don't know how to recover from that whole shit, that whole time. And you saw, I need to have a British education. Yeah. I would kick ass. I would have learned my English better. But it's, it, it's uh, minus my defective language thing. I just want to say, it is holding. It is coming together. And I really want to thank you from my heart, as a filmmaker, as a person, even though I'm 60, I'm, I'm going to make about 100 films before I die, except that psychologically demented black people do not trust black talent. Yeah. You know, Oprah wouldn't see, because she feels uh, uh, illegitimate, she thinks every other black talent is illegitimate. And so in her image, she don't see talent. So we can get down with the psychological aspect of self-hatred. But anyway, thank you for connecting these things. And our movement needs this kind of open, group study, analysis, what they went down. ANC, you know, Zapu, Zanu, all these movements, we understand the, the uh, ignored aspect of that collective. When the vision, we, we love the vision, the vision of independence, even when you were talking about fight, I want to fight still, but I want to fight with tactics. That's why I'm saying we need to go into how do we then do, when we know the enemy is big in arms, Although the Vietnamese people with less arm have gone the audacity, how do Africans now, how do we calculate without eliminating ourselves by being irrational? How do we do a rational struggle, legitimate struggle? Because the coping dehumanizes also. So what do we do? So that's just my next question. Now, I want to give you the chance to ask. I said that out of passion. I hope you understand it from that. And I'm very glad we're doing this study, uh, study group thing. Uh, do you have any question now for the professor? Do I have something I want to say? As I was listening to this, I tried to, I was looking at the film, I think it's called The Other Antonio, the Cuban film. The Cuban film of, of the Last Supper. Yeah, Last Supper. The, the Last Supper. And the Cuban film was speaking to this. I saw this manifesting itself in a film. And that's the film that we don't discuss. We just see it and think that it's a halfway crazy film. And we don't, you know, we don't grasp what that, what that film represents. I also went back to look at what was happening in 1968 when Leo was talking very seriously about just what went on at Howard University with the work that he and Roy had been doing because I, I was there at the time. Now, in that experience, it was towards a black university, it was pan-Africanism towards a new definition, and it was an attempt to, it was always an attempt to, to connect with that. However, it was the closing down of Howard University. However, inside of all of that, there was bring in Anne, 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 Anne Billingsley to the university as, 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 as a vice president for a very special mission of destroying this whole body of work that had come out of that and making certain that that was not going to happen again and that all the people like myself had to be ushered out we into 1970. And that the students who were involved in that struggle had to be prostituted by 1970 and turned out into be freaks of one sort after another. So you end up with a Tony Gittins and all these people. Now, inside of all of that, Billingsley, when he's fired, leaves and goes to College Park and becomes one first professor of sociology, so he's accepted the department, and then becomes provost. Do you see what I'm saying? 
to establish it, College Park and to prepare him to be president of College Park, which was taking on a new definition that's going to lead to the de death of Len Bias and, and the whole drug question in, in the College Park. So that this area, this region, was set up in that point in time to follow a certain path, to make certain, because they knew we had already gone to Newark, we had already gone to Gary, Indiana, we had already gone students from Howard to these places with me, Ed Love and myself, to, 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 to make these new mayors, but they didn't want, they, 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 was, they were happy with a black mayor, but not a chief of staff. So that, that even today, the chief of staff in all these black cities are back to white boys, Italians in this case, as we see them in, in, in Newark or in DC or in, or in Philadelphia or wherever it is, and that there's a certain kind of of, of role for that chief of staff to play in, 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 in this society. And finally, that the understanding of the designing of ecosystems, which became critical at that point, where we spend most of our time talking about Cointel Pro and the assassination of black people. But it was the designing and using the models of ecosystems where certain behavioral patterns were established in Africa with regard to music. This is why Marvin Gaye was saying what's going on. With regard to music, with regard to drugs, with regard to clothes, with regard to sound. That technological breakthrough from 1968 through 1972, under the Nixon administration, under the leadership of Henry Kissinger, changed fundamentally our, our whole struggle and began to channel black students into universities and others into jails. And the dates are the same because we wouldn't deal with, with, with what he was doing. So there's a whole pattern of what happened. The movies that came at that point in time, in the, between 1968 and 1970, that began to speak to the destruction of our people. And then at the same time, jumping off of that, you begin to see Lumumba is gone, and Krumer is gone, Nereri is, 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 is weak, Kenyatta is gone. You begin to see people falling by the wayside one after another in, in, in the experience of, um, of, of, of Africa at that moment. So, 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 so that the, it is very difficult. But you ha and that's how you get a job at Howard. Mm -hmm. That's how Jeff Donaldson gets a job at Howard. That's how Donald Byrd gets a job at Howard. Because to sacrifice what he wanted to do, to compensate, they had to bring you, they had to bring Donald Byrd, they had to bring Jeff Donaldson, and they had to have WHUR. They had to bring the radio and then the television station to move people in another direction between 1992 and, I mean, 19, 1972 and 1976. You, you understand yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. And, and when we went up to Amherst to try to do that again in another location, they wiped us out. And the people who wiped us out were the SNCC people. They wiped us out. Max and Archie Shep and all of us. The, the whole Attica thing, the whole Soledad Brothers, the bringing of people up here to get them out of the country. Asata and everybody else. They wiped all of that out. And they were wiped out by the same people that we sat around. The same graduates of Howard. The same people who were fighting for our struggle in the 60s, what became the people. So all that he is lined up here about those four things about you, you know, the self, and knowing yeah, yourself, yeah, and yeah, looking yeah. through the glass yeah. door darkly, yeah. and who you are and what you represent, uh -huh. those things were put into place. And Leo and, and Roy, they saw it, and Roy broke down. Roy broke down. You can't find him anywhere until he eventually died. He disappeared. They broke him. Sterling Brown. Yeah. Who else wants to come in? Who wants to come in? Who wants to add something? Something to go ahead. Comment or question? Yeah. Um, I took a class once uh, called Group Dynamics. Yes. And that was about 19, probably the best class I've ever taken, okay? I never understood why we were in that class, what was going on the whole time. Mm -hmm. because she just split us up, took us in different rooms, told us different things about each other. By the time we would come back into the room, we didn't even know each other. And we'd be looking at each other like that, and it got to the point where we uh, didn't want to talk to the people in the opposite group. And I was seeing a guy who was in the opposite group, and one day I came in and I didn't want to go out with him.
around him anymore because he was in the opposite group. I mean, and the stuff got that deep. And so what I realized, though, after, after that class, every organization that I went into, I kept saying, well, can't we do what they call sensitivity training or some encounter sessions? And them folks shouted me down. They said, that's that white people shit. We're not doing that in here. Okay. But I don't see how we could not do it. Because it seemed to me that that was the way that I, we were really going to get to know each other and then we could do the serious work. And I still see it now, which is why I'm still afraid to join things if people are not going to try to do that. Yeah, but in some cases too, like uh, to just piggyback on you, in some cases when the black movement went into this therapeutic discussion, it was to self-destroy people. You know, there were cases when in movements discussions happened, but it was a pre-planned uh, yes, yes. sabotage to, to yeah to purge people yeah, even mean, on even that. also on the ghetto level there were these false treatment centers where human beings will sit in center and to help you stop drinking or drugs mm -hmm. you're badgered into non-human non-human and so there is a system I think that he's talking about that we need to understand how to approach this because given our nat our experiential nature meaning not our genetic but what we have gathered, we are liable to repeat the self-destructive oh, yes. mode. Without, we have some people without, trying to set those things yeah, up. Yeah. Like that landmark group, we started out with white people, yeah. but now they got a whole black yeah. landmark oh, to yeah. pull us away from yeah. them. Yeah. And they will take you through those things yeah. lovingly, mm -hmm. so that by the time you come through you those sessions, you are. you're not falling yeah. apart and yes. you know, yeah. feeling all ugly about yourself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let, let me go. Again, I'm talking about real life. They came to us at Harvard in that time. And they said, we want to do some training with welfare mothers mm -hmm. in D.C. <clears throat> and I, we said, Roy and I said, no, we don't want to do that. They insisted. They went to Chief Chief Hall says, you have to do it. So we said, OK, we'll do it. Welfare mothers were getting $39 a month, $39 a week. And they wanted us to do training to show them how with proper organization they could live well on $39. So we kept saying to them, we don't want to do that training. They insisted. So we went. And these three white boys sat in the back of the room in the first session we did. Mm -hmm. And in the very first session, we said to the welfare mothers, we're going to do the first lecture on the dynamics of power. And we're going to discuss power and how people organize to attain power and exercise power. And we did. And boy, they turned, those three fellows turned red. And the next day we arrived, she called us. What did you do? We said we informed black people about the dynamics of power. Yeah. How to achieve power and how to exercise power. Because we were told that we are to train these people to empower them. <laughs> so we took it literally. Well, boy, we, do, we did two sessions and they canceled the cut. Yeah. 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 So what I'm saying is that what you're saying is correct. You see, well, that's why I'm giving you the principles. Because when these things come, you have to have some criteria by which you evaluate them. Different people. Remember now, why we, we, you, let me put it another way. I can bring in here a set of data, and I can give everybody in this room a copy of the same identical data, right? Then I'll say to you, each of you go away, spend one hour looking at this data, come back and tell me how you would react to this data. And I will get, if there are 15 people in the room, I'll get 15 different responses to the same 
identical data. Why is it that 15 human beings dealing with the same identical data will come up with 15 different responses because of the personal makeup of each individual. Because when you come up with a account as to what you want to do, one of the things you never say is that you ask yourself in the final analysis, how is this going to affect me? Am I going to die? Am I going to almost die? Am I going to make some money? Am I going to lose my job? No, you ain't going to tell anybody that you took those things into account. <laughs> but you do. And one of the problems we have that in evaluating our leaders, we evaluate them on every criteria except the psychological. Mm. That's right. okay. That's right. That's when that is the most important. Because decision making, the person who has the ultimate decision to make, is going to color that decision Right? By what he or she perceives to be the ultimate consequence for self and others. Mm -hmm. You understand? Oh, now, if you are afraid of death and you say, if I do this, they're going to kill me, then you ain't going to do that. It's <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> you understand? If you're not afraid of death, then you do it. But then everybody in your own you went, oh God, you go your wife said, what? Your mind? You have to me and treat you and you do something that will cause you to die? Are you mad or something? I've seen so many women divorce their husbands over that. Because the man and, and vice versa, eh? I've seen women who took a stand. And the man said, No, 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 said, no, 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 no. I I'm working on Wall Street. I'm making money, you can't do that. Huh? No, that is the reality of it. That is why I'm showing you all of these things. And I'm saying all human beings, this is not a white thing, a black thing, or a brown thing, but the reaction of different groups will be different. You understand? They all go through the same process. Let me give you a simple example. In the 70s, when the third world was demanding what they call a new international economic order. We, the key of what we said was the natural resources of the world are the patrimony of humankind. That's the, that's the precise word, meaning that it belongs to everybody. Right? Patrimony. It belongs to every, every, and everybody should benefit. Kissinger opposed it. And after a number of months, Kissinger came back and said, we have been thinking about this, and we have come to the conclusion that you are right, that the natural resources of the world are the patrimony of humankind and should be used to the benefit of humanity. And we all said, thank God, Kissinger finally came to his senses, right? and agree with us. So the next time meeting, he came and he says, we are therefore proposing something called the, um, the, I, the International Resources Bank, IRB, the International Resources Bank. We said, what is that? He said, just as how you put your money into a bank, and a number of people put their money in, into the bank, and so people can go and draw on it and borrow from it. We're going to conceptualize the resources of the world as resources to be put into a bank. And these resources and the benefits from it will be shared among humankind. So well, that sounds good. But then we said to him, but Mr. Kissinger, as far as we know, every bank has a board of directors. You say, yeah, of course, you have to have a board of directors who make the ultimate decisions. Listen to this. So we said decisions about who can borrow, who cannot borrow, 
how much you can borrow, how much. He said, yeah, that's, those are the decisions. We said to him, to him, well, who will be the directors of the board? And he looks and he says, obviously, the industrialized nation. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said. Obviously, the industrialized nation. No, the thing had sounded good <laughs> up until that point. But imagine a world in which all the resources are put into a bank, hmm? but only the industrialized nations sit on the board, and they are going to make this about who can benefit from it and who cannot. So I'm saying that sometimes, uh, the other example we had, when we were talking about freedom, they said we are in favor of freedom. So all of us were in favor of freedom. But when we entered into serious negotiations, we found that the Western world wanted freedom to exploit. Mm. We wanted freedom from exploitation. We both agreed <laughs> on freedom. We both wanted freedom. But we, we meant totally different. One meant freedom to exploit. We meant freedom from exploit. So that is why I'm going through all these principles to you. And I'm saying to you, when you're dealing with your adversary, you have to anticipate what your adversary is going to do and how he's going to do it. And if you are on one team, you will react differently to the same data as the other team. But when you see things happening, you must understand how they are happening and why they are happening and you must be able to anticipate what's going to happen next. And you never play to the strength of your enemy. You don't play to the strength of your own. So what you decide to do must be your decision. What is happening at the moment, they have set us up, so we make decisions based on their criteria. Mm -hmm. If you make decisions based on their criteria, you will lose every single time. We have to understand the dynamics of the situation. And that they say in the military, whatever gate is not guarded, that's the gate they're coming through. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, that's a Caribbean and Jamaican logic. Yeah. Whatever gate, gate is not guarded. Can you translate? <laughs> that is the gate that they're coming through. You know, when, when you are fighting, yeah. Anytime you make the mistake of saying they would never do that, yes, that's do. what they're going to do. Okay. All right? No. So therefore, you have to understand. But they're doing the same thing for you. They are trying to find out what gates are unguarded, and you must find out what gates on their side are. On. But you don't play to the strength to the strengths of your opponent. If you play football, soccer, any team that you play. You do not play to the strength of your opponent. They are encouraging you to play to their strength because they know if you play to their strength, you are guaranteed to lose. Right? That is why we go through all of this. Thank you very and much. highly, Thank you see, Nepal. Nepal is yeah. the extension of, yeah. of, of Kissinger's yeah. argument. Yeah. That's where Nepal is today. Yeah. They wanted to have a bigger thing. World Bank. Huh? Yeah. They wanted to have a bigger World Bank. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you have something to ask? Uh, yes. Well, first question what is, um, is I want to know when you're going to, I hope in the next lecture it will be on um, achieving power and exercising. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes soon. Not the next lecture. The next lecture is on the process of planning. No, I mean after the series, sorry, not the next lecture. No, after we do that. Then we go into Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. And when we go into Pan-Africanism, then we begin to talk about what you are talking about. Okay, yeah. How we apply these things. But one of the things that we don't know is how to plan. Mm -hmm. We don't understand the process of planning. The next lecture is on the process mm -hmm. of planning. Having done that, we will then decide that when the next two will And when we go into the following thing, we will then talk about you see, this is the theory. I say theory, but it is not theory because it is based on reality. But I'm trying to give you the principles. But all these principles mean nothing if you can't apply them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the question uh, that I had 
got away from social organization and uh, the fundamental shift that we're seeing um, in the means of production and how people organize socially, moving from the industrial production right now to the information and communication production. And I was wondering, with this shift that's taking place, um, with the liberalization of information really, um, what opportunities do you see there for us as we organize and taking advantage of this fundamental shift that's going on right now in, in the global community? Well, after my next lecture, next week, first of all, let me ask, are, are you planning to do the, the, the other two on Pan African? Yes, yes, separate. All, yes. all of this group? No, I don't mean you, I mean this group, the participants? Oh, we're hoping. Yes. We're hoping. We, we get more, but we're hoping, and we're trying to show the tape for new ones. We want to show tapes first before they come in, mm -hmm. and then in the, when they do come, if they join this group, it's because they have seen the video. Yeah, no, the reason why, let me tell you the reason why I'm asking you this. So the next, after we finish the next lecture, the follow-up is going to be about serious work, and you're going to have to do some work. Up until now, I'm not ask you to do any work. You simply come, sat, and listen. But when you get down to serious business, that ain't it. You have to do work. I'm going to be giving, I have material that I want people to read before they come to the next two. So I'm asking if it's going to be the same group. Yeah, yeah. The, primarily, the, we're hoping the same group, but you know, you can't predict. No, because, uh, yeah. okay. But All primarily right. the same group as we're because hoping. But not the same group alone. Because well, I think it, it, there's some more. people who want to come during the fall, and what I told them was I they would have to be briefed I from understand. the video lecture. Yeah. But so what I'll do after my next lecture, I'll give the materials to you. Okay, and then we pass it early. You pa we'll pass it out before we start. Yeah. Because they have to do work now. You see, this idea of just sitting down and listening is That's a right. passive That's exercise. Right. It ain't going to work like that. Yeah. You have to do some work. You have to read. We don't like to read. You better read. You've got to read. You have some serious things have occurred, and they are in writing. Mm -hmm. When we told people this in the 70s, they said they, they wanted to put Kathleen and myself in a mental institution. They said, can't be true. <laughs> America wouldn't do that. <laughs> Those documents yeah. have, are now declassified, and you can read them. I want you to read them. If you read it, you understand what happened to the black movement in the 60s and 70s. But it was not available at that time. They have now been declassified, and I'm going to give you copies of them to take home and read so that you can begin to understand what happened to the black movement, how it was destroyed. It is all in writing. Now we're telling people what is happening. They say, no, it is nonsense. That can't happen. <laughs> Right? So this last question you asked is part of what we will be talking about. Because we are into a new paradigm. First of all, anytime they declassify a document, it means they're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you spend a lot of time fighting against that when that phase is over and they're into something else. But you need to understand, because whatever they did, they're still doing plus something else. But right now, the, what they did then, while they're still doing it, it is not the priority at this time. Huh? No. So what they do, whenever they want to, when they introduce a new plan of action, they release the old plan of action, and you spend your time fighting against the old plan of action while they're implementing the new plan yeah, like yeah. of action. Huh? So that is where we, we are. So just bear with us for one more lecture. Let's give them again a hand. Okay. Uh, there, uh, uh, as a, uh, you know, uh, Haki Maraburi at 7.30 Friday. Uh, we're hoping the topic, what we gave them to a group that proposed is the miseducation of the Negro in the era of Obama, or it's a question mark. It's not like uh, absolute position, just the miseducation of black people using Woodson Carter with question mark in the era of Obama. 
So Haki will be here presenting a lecture. And uh, it's Friday, tomorrow, Wednesday. Please let's be in time. Uh, even if our professor comes late, because uh, 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 don't worry, you can come late. We can we can afford that. Right? Uh, you are so great for us, and we want to make sure we don't exhaust. That's why I'm like trying to stop it quickly because I don't want to exhaust you. Yeah, I remember when we exhausted Ackland, he started going to hospital quickly <laughs> in more I frequent go to rates. On Friday, so I, I know you you do it on frequent rates when yes. we exhaust you. So thank you again on behalf of everybody. But I'll tell you one thing: you have to promise me now. In the next shoot, I, you either have to come early or I think early because I want to ask you a little bit for the video, little biographical sketches, one. I was very touched, I don't know uh, if you can help me on this, when you talked about the Howard faculties organizing the takeover of a city for black mayors. It's untold history. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. untold. Yeah. I was like, you know, because I have, I have been at Howard 30, 40 years, you know, I'm really frustrated because I came on myth. Hmm. And I'm in a fog now. And so when you said that, I start to even appreciate the potential of Howard, the history of Howard, the courage of individuals at Howard, which we sometimes forget because it gets in the soup of Cheek and uh, the new president, this Napoleonic complex president hmm. we have. And so I was touched. I, fe I felt I'm good I was here at Howard. I felt good yeah. because there were teachers like you and your, your other comrade who went to Gary, Indiana. That struggle is an amazing movie. And thank you for it. I don't know if you want to say something on that. I was touched. I was really touched. Let me just ask you, I just got back from uh, Louisville. I was there all week for, for training and went to this black cultural center, met a brother who was an integral part of, of SNCC. And he just shared with me that uh, Samuel Yet. Um, has returned back to, uh, and, and that he now has Alzheimer's and, and mentioned that you know he has some copies available of his book. So I, I bought uh, several copies of his book and, and shared them with some students that I was doing some workshops with. And they couldn't believe what Sam had wit written back in 1971. Um, and I, was, I just wanted to, to get you know your, your feedback on... No, Sam and I were very close. Okay. Sam was a part of, of, of the group that was Bruce okay. Caesar's work. And he wrote his book on the, the plan. Mm -hmm. And people thought he was mad. He yes. Was, yeah. yes. People, I mean, they wanted to put all of us in a mental institution. Because it was, they said, America would never do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. right? It turns out we now have the documentation that everything that he wrote was true. Yeah. But people at the time, but, and I wasn't worried about it. White people, Christ, but our own people were willing to put us in a mental institution yeah. because they thought we were mad to tell them yeah. that the U.S. government, which is the greatest democracy on earth, which is in favor of freedom and democracy, would never ever do that. Now, years later, we now know they did all of that and more. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this one thing. We are studying ourselves for this reason. I'll tell you, when you study Paul Robeson, white folks didn't bring him down. It's black people. Mm -hmm. So what is this? I think we have to go towards our own. That's what I like about the whole thing is self-analysis, self-scrutiny. Because to me, as, as you were just saying now, no black hero. Du Bois, nobody was defeated by white people. The, when you lose the black community, when the black community uh, of course, there were pockets of people who helped, but when you feel your community is not believing you or believing in you, that's the worst uh, thing we do to our leaders. Well, let me go say this. I'm, I'm sorry to keep it going, but this is important. We had at home in those days, first of all, you have to understand, however educated you were, you could not teach in a white university. So they all came the brightest minds were at Howard. You had Alain Locke, Eugene Holmes in philosophy. Right? You had Ralph Bunch, Eric Williams, and after them a fellow called Emmett Dorsey in political science. You had E. Franklin Frazier in sociology. Rayford Logan, John uh, Hope Franklin, Merce Tate in history. Harold Lewis in history. These were all 
And we had a president, Vodica, who was committed to the freeing of non-white people throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And he was committed to that. So we got full support from him. You understand that? All right, now, <clears throat> then Mordecai resigned. And we won't go into the details. In those days, not many blacks could go on to do a PhD. They just didn't have the money. And in any case, the white universities were not accepting that. So if you had a master's degree, and experience, you could become a professor at Harvard in those days. The first thing they did was to change the rules. You could not be a professor if you didn't have a PhD. So Emmett Dorsey found himself, one of the most brilliant minds I have ever encountered, found himself about to be thrown out as chairman of the Department of Political Science because he did not have the PhD. Mm -hmm. This was the time when they were trying to destroy Paul Robles. So Emmett Lawson went over to Catholic University to do his PhD. And the professor said it to him, because the prof he was much brighter than his professor. And the professor said to him, Lawson, let us assume for argument that there's a debate. He said, no, a debate is not about truth. A debate is simply defending a fixed position. So let us assume you're having a debate and you had to argue against a person who is a socialist or a communist. What arguments would you use against that? So Evan Dawson, thinking it was just a theoretical thing, gave the answer. Right? So if this was just a debate, and I'm just trying to prove my skill at argumentation. This is what I would say, right? The next thing we knew, there appeared in the Washington Post, headline story, saying that white black people are lionizing Paul Robinson, the communist. Here is a brilliant professor of Howard who is destroying by this and quoted everything that Emmett Dorsey had said. But Emmett Dorsey said, if it were just a debate, this is what I would say. It did not represent his views. Mm -hmm. But he had just finished writing his thesis. Eh? Emmett Dorsey became so because he was a disciple of Paul Robinson. Mm -hmm. He was so distraught, he became alcoholic. And one of the pitiful sights was to go on Howard's campus and see Emmett Dorsey staggering across the campus. Because he had been presented as an opponent of Paul Robinson. And all Howardites said, if Emmett Dorsey says so, is so. You understand? And they used that as the one of the final nails in, to drive, to destroy Paul Rowe, when Emmett Dorsey was a disciple and admirer of Paul Robinson. You understand? That is how Bishop again. To add to, add to yes. that, Emmett Dorsey was in the Soviet Union at the same time with Paul Robeson, was in London with Paul Robeson, was one of the great thinkers of of our time, knew Trotsky and Lenin and Stalin personally and worked hard. He wrote, Emmett Dorsey was the person who really moved Du Bois from where Du Bois was with the NAACP between 1910 and 1935 to the writing of Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. He wrote that and moved Du Bois to the left on it. And Emmett Dorsey, he was deep, he, and the man was about six foot ten, about two hundred and eighty pounds, like a like an offensive lineman. And to see him walk out of Howard drunk, to go to U Street early in the morning at ten and eleven o'clock to remain drunk, he still in Brown and all of them. And they were, I was there. I he was my he was my professor. I, I'm telling you, and 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 he was legendary. 
and the machine worked and worked to destroy him, destroy Frazier, destroy all of them. I knew these people. Do you have the Washington Post clips? No, I don't. Know. I wish you'd look for it. Well, yeah, you could look give for us it. the year. We could go into the. Oh yes, yes, oh, yes. We can yeah. do that. We so listen, we have a lot to say. We yeah. have a lot. I'm telling you. Oh, I wish my students were here. Hmm. My yeah. students, Next graduate students. Them. I'm not talking about undergraduates. They need to hear this. Well, that's the. Uh, well, I don't think they want to hear it. Uh, no, oh, yeah. I don't think they want to hear it. I see you on Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. I see you get some rest. Wednesday. Thank you, brother.